for me, this is definitely a good morning. I know at least when I was in college, I didn't have any classes before 10 a.m., so I'm glad, I'm glad to see this was scheduled uh, at a good time for everybody. Um, but it's a really uh, a privilege for me to be here. Um, I, you know, I just learned about the Community Teach program. I know about uh, our Skills Succeed program pretty well, um, but it's a, it's a real privilege to actually get to participate in that, um, especially uh, in, a, in a program like this. So. Um, I've got some slides here. Consultants like to use slides, um, so I'm going to I'm going to get into those and um, and kind of open open the session with that. But um, what I'm hoping to do is is engage you all in um, in somewhat of an interactive discussion. Um, as you'll see, you know we're, we're talking about global emerging markets, um, and as a big part of that, trying to understand you know, how that's impacting how businesses are going about their business now, um, and wanting to kind of get some thoughts from you all based on what you either have already seen or what you would maybe hope businesses might be thinking about. Um, when they're thinking more globally, uh, and in particular, not just thinking globally and how they can do better themselves, but how they can you know, do well as companies while also doing good uh, kind of at the same time, which is a, a real growing trend now, especially um, in the global emerging markets. Um, so I'll get started here, hopefully with um, a couple of videos. Are you guys familiar with the Verizon ads? You know, when somebody, when they, when they pull up the graphs and they say, hey, what's, what's the fastest service? And it's kind of obvious, right? You have like, you know, the big bar chart that says Verizon and then all the other little bar charts that say Sprint and Nextel and whatever. They say, what's the best choice? People say Verizon. Then he shows them another graph. And they say, OK. And then you know, Verizon's a big line at the top. All the different ways of showing them, you know, at the end of the day, everybody says Verizon. Um, so just wanted to play a couple of these, because I think it'll um, set somewhat of a good tone. Oops, that was the wrong slide there. Hopefully the internet will work for me. Four G LTE has the fastest speeds. So let's talk. Let's talk about coverage. Based on this chart, who would you choose? Wow. Guys, <laughs> take a minute. Verizon. I'm going to show you guys another chart. Pretty obvious. I don't think color matters. Pretty obvious. What's pretty obvious about it? Verizon has the coverage. Verizon. Verizon. We're going to get to another chart. It doesn't really matter how you present it. It doesn't matter how you present it. Verizon, more 4G LTE coverage than all other networks combined. Okay. In, in case that didn't hit home, and since I don't, have, I don't want to have you guys have to listen to my voice too much, I'll do a couple more videos of it. Oops, I keep doing that. Four G LTE is the fastest. So, which super fast four G LTE service would you ch would you choose based on this chart? Don't rush into it. I'm not looking for the fastest answer. Obviously, Verizon. Okay. I have a different chart going that way. Does that make a difference? Well, the Verizon is so much more than the other ones. So, what if we just change the format altogether? Isn't that the exact same thing? That's pretty clear. Still sticking with Verizon. Verizon. More 4G LTE coverage than all other networks combined. All right. So Verizon did a pretty good job of getting their point across, right? So I'm hoping, hoping some data on emerging markets will do the same. Um, so based on this chart here, what's growing faster? Grays 2011, dark blues 2030, lighter blues 2060. What's that? Well, which side of the chart, right? So if, there's, if this is a group of, um, this is essentially a group of countries on the left, and then a group of other countries on the right, and this group of countries in 2011 is pretty, pretty high up there, right? This is a percent of the total, and then this is the, the timeline. So is this group of countries growing faster, or is the one on the right growing faster? Well, if you look at where their, where their gray chart is, right, the gray is where they are now. And then if you look at their percentage, it's actually going down in each of these scenarios, right, on the left. Mm -hmm. Then if you're looking on the right, you know, this one's under 40%, this one's under 20%, that one's probably a little under 10%. And then they're growing pretty quickly from 2011 to 2030 to 2060. Mm -hmm. So which, which one's going fast? The one on the right, right? Agreed. 
Good answer. <laughs> so what this represents on the left here, uh, OECD versus non-OECD. OECD is basically collection of the biggest countries in the world, right? Um, those that are developed have, uh, have the most money as it stands now, uh, the largest GDP growth. So the US, Japan, kind of Euro European countries, um, and then kind of the rest of these OECD countries on the left. On the right, you'll see China, India, and then the others, so that, you know, Africa, India, some, some of the other countries that um, just at this point in the game are, are much smaller in terms of kind of the global, global economy. Uh, but by 2060, they're kind of showing us that they're going to be percentage-wise larger than, you know, India is going to be larger than the U.S. and non-OECD no, non countries, these smaller, poorer countries right now are going to be um, catching up and, and in some cases surpassing. Um, how about in this case? So this is a 2011, a picture of 2011, these, these countries here, right? What does it look like is going to be growing fastest by 2060? The, company, the, or the clients and, sorry, the countries on the left here or the countries on the right? Right. They start taking over by 2060. So just another way of showing, right? India, China, and these other you know, smaller emerging markets um, currently make up only 35% um, of the global market right now, right? Um, fast forward about 50 years from now, they'll be taking over half of the global economy. So what, what we're seeing today, right, in the country that we live in and in for you know, most of the developed countries, um, they're going to have a lot more competition and they're going to have a, you know, a lot less of the, the overall pie, right? So just a, a pretty striking view. And then just another video to to give you some more, uh, more detail on, on kind of what's happening in these markets. The global economy is expected to grow by 3% annually over the next half century. But growth will be much stronger and much faster in emerging economies than in the developed countries of the OECD. The United States is the world's biggest economy today, representing 23% of global economic activity. The GDP will shrink to 18% by 2030 and just 17% in 2060. China, which produces about 17% of global GDP today, is expected to pass the US to become the world's biggest economy. It will produce 28% of global GDP in 2030 and should stay at that level through 2060. China's growth and that of other fast developing emerging countries will be driven by a better educated and more productive workforce. India will also benefit from population growth. It will jump from 7% of global GDP today to 11% in 2030 and 18% in 2060. Population aging, on the other hand, will drag down growth in many countries and regions. The euro area is the world's second leading economy, with 17% of global GDP. As the number of active Europeans declines, Europe's share of the world economy will drop to 12% by 2030 and just 9% by 2060. Japan, which accounts for 7% of global GDP today, faces a similar crisis. Its aging population will push its share of global GDP down to 4% by 2030 and just 3% by 2060. Today, the 34-country OECD represents 65% of global GDP. This will drop to just 43% in 2060, smaller than China and India, and well below the combined GDP of emerging economies. Incomes and living standards in emerging economies will converge with those in the OECD. Today, per capita GDP in countries like China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, 
Brazil, Mexico, and Turkey is just a fraction of that in the United States. After 50 years of rapid growth and shifting wealth, the emerging countries have drastically reduced the income gap with the United States. Richer OECD countries like France, Italy, Spain, Ireland, Greece will see their per capita income fall when compared with the US. None of these OECD projections are set in stone. Improving public finances and implementing bold structural reforms can boost long-term growth and living standards in advanced and emerging economies alike. So was that, uh, was that surprising to anybody? No, I've seen some head nods and some head shakes, I guess. How many of you kind of had a sense that, that, that the U.S. was going to be, you know, lagging, lagging pretty far behind? Yeah. How about, you know, in, in terms of the, the countries that are kind of on the rise, have you guys kind of been hearing about some, you know, China, India, some of these other countries that are growing, right? Um, I've been hearing that for a while. I think doing some, <laughs> doing some research just to kind of prepare for this, it was still striking to me just how much, um, you know, 50 years is going to change the world, right? And I think if we looked back, it would, it would be even different. Um, so <laughs> I think what that, you know, kind of tells us in the, you know, as, as we open, you guys are kind of coming into a much different world than you know, your parents did um, however many years ago, um, than, I, you know, than even I, I was probably coming out of the... the uh, coming out of college and into the job market, it's just increasingly global and increasingly um, competitive um, as a result. Um, you know, and a, another piece of the puzzle is, is not just that the, the world is, is changing and beca because these countries are growing really fast in terms of um, their you know, gross domestic product, in terms of the, the money that they're, um, that they're making as a country, um, but, but also the, the kind of changing dynamic that there's also extreme poverty in a lot of these countries. Um, and that there's you know, growing uh, needs and demands for electricity, right? If you're going to be um, growing at the rate that a lot of these countries are going to be growing at over the next um, four or five decades, um, you know, a lot of them don't have the sort of resources that we do as a country now. You know, we're driving around, we're um, using wireless internet, all this, all this stuff that uh, the U.S. is pretty used to. Um, a lot of these emerging markets are going to be growing at this exceedingly uh, accelerating pace. Um, but they're also going to need the energy and the resources, um, both from a natural resources perspective, so the kind of energy, electricity, um, and power, but also the kind of human resources, right? The, um, the education systems, um, the, the men and the women, um, women in developing countries in particular, are becoming increasingly um, important and kind of integral to the success and to the growth of these countries. So. Um, Pretty interesting stuff and a pretty fascinating time to be studying any of this. So it's, it's I, I didn't study any of this in school. I was like a pre-law, wanted to be a lawyer, wanted to maybe work in some sort of social justice area, working um, on the legal side of things, on the regulatory side of things. Um, and I hadn't really considered business as having this kind of global impact, right? Um, or if it did have a global impact, it was just kind of in a, in a way that I wasn't interested in. Um, but you know, to be actually learning what what's going on in the in the world right now and in, in these different countries um, can can have a big impact on what what your careers might be or what um, what you might choose to uh, do as a result of this. Um, let's see if this is working here. So the the hope I was having here is that we we kind of go through an exercise. I'll I'll pr provide a bit more information um, about kind of a global context and, and some market needs that that exist based on this uh, these growing emerging markets and the the kind of uh, challenges that they're going to face um, and that companies are going to face um, in relation to these. So um, these countries will be facing the challenges of growing their markets um, and the the companies that are already existing in the U.S. or in Europe or in Japan. Um, are going to have to think about how to um, really engage these these growing markets, right? Um, and you know, at least in terms of the the type of work that I do, there's also a growing trend in um, in you know either people coming out of school wanting to to not just make money but do do good for others while they're doing that. Um, and there's a trend in business to to figure that out as well. There's there's a trend in these large multinational corporations to not just 
um, find ways to make more money in these growing countries, but also how to, to kind of help lift people out of poverty at the same time, right? So that's, it's also a pretty fascinating time where there's, um, there's kind of demands not just to, to see shareholder stock prices go up, um, but to see shareholder stock prices go up while also um, taking care of those that are, that are involved in, in every piece of the supply chain for these companies, right? Whether it's farmers in Africa or Latin America or, um, you know, uh, other sorts of laborers in different value chains for different companies that, that are communications companies, right? So there's a lot of different um, kind of scenarios we could go down to, to think about you know, how companies are, are, are thinking about these new global emerging markets. Um, but the one that, that I think would be pretty interesting and that's, um, you know, relatively uh, universal is, is around this idea of um, you know, the role of the private sector in, um, in helping to achieve Millennium Development Goals and how to, um, to have the private sector continue to um, do, you know, do well by their shareholders or by their, um, their board. So they have to make money in order to be a private uh, company and, and, and operate in the, um, in the market. Um, but there's a continuing kind of push to actually be involved in a lot more than just uh, making money as a business. Um, how many of you for, are familiar with the Millennium Development Goals? Have you guys heard of these before? Yeah. They're, they've actually been around for a little while, but that's part of the problem. And there's a lot of people who have never heard of these, um, and that's for a lot of reasons. Um, in short, the Millennium Development Goals were, were, were created a while back um, by a bunch of people, you know, the United Nations in particular and some other um, you know, nonprofit entities and some government organizations that all tried to come together and say, look, we're, we're, we're going to try to solve some of the world's biggest challenges, right? Um, those challenges include you know, extreme poverty, environmental sustainability, um, gender inequality and, and you know, uh, disenfranchised women, uh, child mortality, um, you know, maternal health, HIV, AIDS. There's just a, a huge number of seemingly insurmountable problems, right? Um, so they set these goals. They're called the Millennium Development Goals, uh, MDGs for short. Um, and folks have been working at trying to achieve these goals for a long time. Uh, there's definitely been progress made against them, um, both by you know, nonprofits internationally or by you know, these domestic governments in, in various countries, um, and by in some cases, companies trying to help out either through uh, you know, financial donations or in-kind services. Um, but there's still a pretty long way to go. Um, however, in particular, if you look at the kind of first and the seventh goal, um, so eradicating poverty and um, ensuring environmental sustainability, those are two that, when you think about it, um, businesses and the private sector has a pretty big role to play. Because at the end of the day, businesses either help people to be making money or not making money, right? Um, and businesses are typically the primary consumers of energy, whether it's um, manufacturing companies using a lot of energy to create their goods and services, um, or you know, uh, transportation of, of goods and services from one, you know, one, one place to another. They're, they're typically the ones with the biggest uh, consumption of, of energy, right? So that those are two areas when, you know, if you're thinking about not just how to um, tap into these markets as they're growing, uh, but also how to help uh, help kind of people in the environment along the way. Uh, those are two areas that the private sector is becoming a lot more involved in in trying to make a difference. Um, and it, as we'll kind of discuss, and as you you know you may or may or may not already kind of um, have heard uh, or would would imagine and hope, you know it, it's really not just about um, trying to help. <laughs> As much as that would be a good thing, companies have been doing that for a while. They'll give money away. They'll um, they'll donate time and, and resources, and they have philanthropy programs like Accenture's Skills to Succeed, uh, which is incredibly important. But they're they're getting increasingly um, focused on the fact that you know if they don't invest in a mutually beneficial way, you know if they're not um, thinking about these emerging markets, for example, as um, you know, future investments in their in the people that would be um, Em, you know, employed by that company down the road, um, if they aren't taking care of the people in those countries, then they won't be able to have a business in those countries, right? If, if the environment is, you know, essentially ruined, or if a natural resource in that country is um, isn't around in 50 years, um, then they won't be able to continue making the money that they're making, right? So it's this this kind of mutually beneficial um, relationship, and, and this is where the private sector is really um, 
starting to get more and more involved in, in some of these social and environmental issues. So I, I think the path we'll go down for this exercise is, is around the energy uh, side of things. Um, I'll, I'll go through kind of the situation, right? So the, the situation and the complication. Um, we kind of already see the situation. We saw that the emerging markets are growing. Um, we saw that uh, non-OECD countries, these kind of emerging markets, um, are on the rise. Um, you know, the complication is if they're going to be growing and they're going to be uh, kind of catching up to the U.S. in terms of their size and, and their uh, kind of economies, they're going to need to use a lot of electricity, right? They're going to, for the most part, increase the, de the demand they have for energy. So that's what this chart on the left shows. Um, you know, in short, if you're looking at this, it kind of, this one stops at 2030, so it doesn't even go to the 2060 um, chart that we were looking at, right? But, um, you know, it's more than doubling the amount of energy that these countries are using now. That's a pretty, it's a pretty staggering thought to think that in just 20, 20 or so years, Africa, India, um, some of the emerging markets in Latin America are going to be literally doubling the amount of energy that they use. Um, you know, at the same time, um, there's a trend in what this chart on the right shows is the type of fuel that's going to be used to get there. Um, and at the end of the day, right now, the majority of the um, fuel that's used to fuel these, you know, our own country and others is uh, essentially non-renewable energy. So coal, for example, right? That's this chart in, in purple. Um, but by 2035, the expectation is that there's going to be, um, you know, between uh, this green bar here, it's kind of increased and uh, over doubled over time by 2035. That kind of renewable energy, right? That's kind of a buzzword now, renewable energy or sustainability. But it's a buzzword because it's actually um, a real development, and there's some some serious. Uh, trends in that area, and there's a need for these renewable resources in order to, to kind of grow the, the economies that we're working in. Um, so the other challenge is you know, how to get these renewable energies to countries that hardly have any energy to begin with. Right? Um, so that's, that's one, one challenge. Uh, the access to energy, right? So the, the fact that they're going to have to increase demand for energy coupled with the fact that they're having increased demand for energy that's renewable, which we don't have enough of yet. And so there needs to be more, um, more companies that are creating those sorts of clean energy products. Um, as it stands now, <laughs> the, the amount of electricity that people actually have access to in these countries is, is pretty remarkably low. If you're looking at the, um, the chart on the left, it's just the number of millions of people in, in some of these emerging markets that have uh, essentially no access to electricity. So each of those charts, it's a little hard to see, so I apologize about that, but um, each of these charts has the vast majority of them filled with people without access to electricity. So even though the OECD countries are, or non-OECD countries are expected to grow um, and catch up to the US and Europe and, and Japan, um, and they're expected to use all this energy, um, they don't have it, <laughs> right? So that's kind of a problem. Um, and then on the right here, this is showing, again, electricity access. So in the top right, these are all the countries that have it. So that's why you don't see the US on here, because we all have access to electricity. Um, China, essentially, they almost all have access to electricity. Brazil, that's an emerging market that um, is kind of ahead of most of the rest. So they have access to the uh, electricity that they'll need. Um, and then if you look at the, the kind of horizontal part of this chart, um, this is the share of population with an income of less than two dollars a day. So I think you guys, have, have you guys heard that stat? Like, how many people in the world live under two dollars a day? It's in the, you know, in the billions, I think. Um, so if you look all the way off to the left, countries like India, um, where, you know, over, looks like 25 percent or so of people don't have access to electricity, uh, and about 25 percent, um, or. 75% live on less than $2 a day. So that's, that's a country in need of some help, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, Nigeria as well. And most of these green countries, or all these green countries, are, are sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then the orange um, 
are developing Asia, so kind of emerging markets in Asia. So the other challenge, you know, in addition to the fact that they, they need energy, is that they don't have it. Um, and then uh, I won't go into as much detail on this one, but not just the need for kind of clean energy and renewable energy so that they can keep using over time, not just an access to it, um, but then you know, the, the resource efficiency. So there's a, hybrid cars is the big thing that we probably all think about when we think of um, sustainability and uh, energy efficiency these days. Um, in most of these countries, it's less of a concern about you know, saving some money on your, your uh, gasoline bill every month and, and <laughs> actually having access to water, right? Or having water that's not used up um, inefficiently by uh, manufacturing companies or um, by basically anybody that would uh, really not use it in a, in a uh, long-term sustainable way. So what this chart shows, um, OECD and um, OECD countries essentially have very little water stress. Um, BRIC, anybody know what BRIC stands for? BRIC. Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Yeah, exactly. So those are the, that's like the big, big handful of emerging markets um, that are growing at the fastest rate, as you saw from the video. Um, so this, this says there are 1.5 billion people um, who live with severe water stress in those countries, um, or w will between now and, and 2030, right? And then in the rest of the world, um, it's, a, it's a similar challenge, right? But BRIC is where there's, there's some pretty, um, pretty severe issues, right? Um, so in addition to the need for energy, um, a lot more than they currently have, um, the access to it, so that the people who are most in need have the least access to the energy. Um, and then the, the fact that people are not using energy very efficiently, so even the energy they have is theoretically um, not going to be available anymore, right? Um, so what I was hoping to do is, is kind of get your all's thoughts on um, how, how we can think about or how you guys can think about in, in your class or as you are kind of looking at different companies that you may want to work with or nonprofits that you're looking at or um, government jobs, you know, what are the... What are the possible solutions and, and approaches to um, how, how to kind of solve some of these problems of, of helping growth in these countries at the same time as keeping the U.S., our own country, competitive and, and healthy? And, um, and how, in particular, in this area of um, kind of energy as one market need uh, in these growing, uh, growing economies, you know, if we start from the business side, um, how can businesses think about growing in these markets while also, um, you know, essentially helping the people and the environments of those countries along the way? Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so I'll go through a couple of slides to, to set, the, um, set the stage a little bit. Um, some of the trends that are happening right now are, um, you know, basically that people are partnering. Uh, not people, but uh, companies are partnering. Uh, with nonprofits and with governments um, to help solve either their own challenges or the, you know, again, the challenges of these countries. Um, so typically, there's nonprofits and governments that invest a lot of money in these countries and they um, try to make an impact that way. And then there's market based solutions. So a company tries to you know, open up operations in another country and lift people up by getting them, you know, getting more jobs or generating more uh, economic development. Um, what's happening now is there's kind of more of a convergence and, and those sides trying to work together. So that's, that's one thing we could kind of talk about is what are, what are examples of that. Um, and related to it is you know, how, how can, uh, in a certain partnership, organizations invest um, in different ways. Right now, most people are used to investing as a, uh, as a company on their own, going into a country and investing some money in that country. Um, there's also a little bit of where a government might be investing in the infrastructure of a country and the company might be trying to invest in um, building a, you know, a manufacturing plant and then trying to export stuff out. So parallel investment is what we'd call that. And then there's this idea of co-investment where um, you know, companies are investing some percentage of uh, the amount it would take to build that road and a government might be you know, covering the rest of that. Um, and then there might be banks that are covering the loans. So there's kind of innovative uh, models to kind of make these solutions happen and 
could talk about how, how it, that could be relevant in, uh, in the energy side. And then finally, it's this idea of sustainable value creation. Um, there's another kind of terminology for this that's out there. It's called shared value. Um, but in short, it's just a, a way that, that people are talking about businesses um, thinking more uh, long term and, and, and more around this kind of mutually beneficial uh, way of operating. Um, so um, what, basically what this is talking about is you know, there's a core business mandate for companies like Pepsi. So you know, Pepsi wants to deliver 30, 33% revenue. That's their, their company's mandate for a certain year. Um, and their social responsibility or their philanthropy might be to um, improve their own water efficiency if they're using, if they're taking water from one of these countries, how they can do that more efficiently. Um, and their foundation might be donating, uh, you know, in this case, $25 million, $26 million um, for things like nutrition and education and, uh, and things that are related to their business and maybe the impact that they have. But what's even more exciting now is, is things like the sustainable value creation, um, where they're investing in farmer training and infrastructure in Mexico um, to improve the quality of corn that's supplied for their Pepsi products um, in the company factory while la raising the living standards of those around them. So they're thinking much more holistically, right? They're not just saying, what's the cheapest source of water and the cheapest source of hydrogenated corn oil um, to make our Pepsi, um, but can we make a better type of Pepsi that actually helps the farmers and makes us more profitable. Right? So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff thing that, that these companies are, are thinking through. And um, basically wanted to get thoughts from you if you guys wanted to throw out example companies that we could think about, uh, especially around this energy idea. Um, so Pepsi could even be one of them. We could talk about Pepsi and how they could think about energy differently. Um, but you know, what, are, what are some companies that you guys like, don't like, would want to do a little exercise with? How about you? Johnson Johnson, that's a good one. Everybody, everybody's familiar with Johnson Johnson? Anybody use Old Spice? Wait, is Old Spice Johnson? Is that Procter & Gamble? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Johnson Johnson. Uh, what are some of their products? I'm blanking. Babies, Johnson Johnson, baby shampoo. I should know that because I have a daughter that I use that for. Johnson Johnson, does that sound good? Any, any other thoughts? Nike. That's a good one. Votes for Nike. I can hardly see your hands. Votes for Nike. <laughs> okay, votes for Johnson and Johnson. Okay, I think Nike Nike beats out, but I like the baby shampoo. So, um, okay. So if we're thinking about um, basically this, we'll focus as much as we can on energy. But basically, what we want to think through is um, similar to how Pepsi formulated this sustainable value creation. Uh, concept. Um, we want to think about how Nike can be both, uh, you know, financially profitable, um, but have an impact on a social and an environmental side. And the more we can get to the environmental, great, because we have some information on that. But really, whatever you guys think about about Nike, we can kind of go from there. Um, so I'm going to say Nike SVC for sustainable value creation. Um, so what, are, what do you guys think Nike needs to think about if they're going to? Factories. Factories, OK. So I maybe call that production, right? OK. What else do you think they need to think about? Transportation. We might need to broaden that bucket, but I like that. What else? Yeah. Storage. Storage. Yep. So we're going to actually, that's part of what I thought by broadening transportation. So that'll be the storage, the moving, all that's kind of in here. So um, storage plus transport. The labor. Labor. Uh, OK, so we'll, we'll break that off of here. Say labor. And then you thought it was like the manufacturing materials, okay? About the, factors of labor. the factors of labor. Uh -huh. Yep, that's <laughs> its own. <laughs> factors of production. 
Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, what else? Where do you guys want to go? Marketing. Marketing. Yeah. So maybe uh, promotion we'll put in here. Um, anything else? The energy, energy, yeah. So we'll put that kind of in in production, <laughs> but it also kind of comes down here in, in transportation, right? Okay. Okay. And I heard something else when we were talking about energy. quality and efficiency. Okay. So that kind of touches on a lot of these, right? So in the production, there would be a lot of quality control and efficiency that we'd need to think about. Um, and then down here in transportation and kind of storage, there'd be a lot of efficiency around getting things from point A to point B. Um, okay. So yeah, we can definitely think about, about that as well. Anything else? We'll put price in here because they've still got to figure out how to price, price it. What's that? Location. Location, Location. yeah. Yeah. So call it place. And place. So where do you guys want to start to keep going deeper? Because what we can do is just keep thinking about all these different components that go into it and where they might have the most uh, opportunity, right, to make more money while helping more people or having a better impact on the environment. I don't know where you would place it, but certainly the company has to decide which area in the world they're going to work with. Sure. So that's right here, right? In so order to achieve their sustainable value creation. Agreed. So place. Okay. Um, let's say, uh, this will be the country. And then you might need to go more specifically into that. So any of the countries that we've talked about sound like countries Nike would want to operate in? Yeah. India, right. Um, okay. Where, where, do you, where do most of your Nike shoes probably get made now? China, yeah. Any other areas of the world you think they might want to start operating in based on, what's that? You could see Brazil. So, okay, this will broaden that to maybe other areas in Asia. You guys missing any other big? Russia. Russia? Mm -hmm. Okay, could be in Russia. So these are, we're get, we're get, we've got the brick down, right? We didn't do it quite in order, but <laughs> there's your brick. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to add a letter to, to brick, you'd probably put an A at the end and call it Bricka or something. Mm -hmm. um, I might coin that might be the new the new thing. Um, okay, okay. So that's big. So we'd have to think about these emerging markets, and that's one of the big things. And then in it, the the other factor, I guess, is you know we know they're already in China in a big way. So maybe if they're going to enter into new markets, so do you want to want to pick one of these between Africa, Russia, India, mm -hmm. India. Okay. All right. So we're going to focus in India. And then within India, what do we need to, to think about in terms of these other areas? Well, for energy, um, if, if they look toward more like, like hydro energy and like wind, so mm -hmm. it's renewable, I mean, okay. it's better for the environment. And if it's renewable, they're going to, I mean, the profit they make is going to stay uh, in the company. So essentially, they don't have to get you know. Okay. So. You're saying the profit that they make will stay within their company. Um, what about the upfront cost it's going to be to to build? Well, I mean, over the long term, it's going to be. I think agree. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, because what we're seeing, right, is that this is going to be a long. If they have renewable energy sources, they'll have less cost for their long-term production and all that. Do you think Nike though can create their own hydro plant? Anything is possible. Nike is a pretty big partnership, right? So that's that's a good call. So that's where 
This is the Nike value chain, right? And, and the different issues that they got to think about. But stuff like energy is where they might be only might only be able to go so far. If we were talking about, you know, a agricultural company or like you know Johnson and Johnson and product company, where they have a little bit more control over their value chain, like in a, you know farming, and they can farm more sustainably, um, then I think they would have some more control. But energy, that's kind of a a huge huge investment in terms of infrastructure. So this this is where we would need kind of the public-private partnership stuff, right? Um, we would need the government to, to have good policies. You know, is the U has the U.S. figured out its own energy policies yet? No. no. So if, Indi if U.S. has, and India's probably got some work to do too, but they've also got an opportunity to get pretty far ahead of the U.S. if they do it right quickly, right? Um, so th we'll think about the strategy for Nike to have a public-private partnership. That's another conversation. Uh, what, el what else is something you guys would want to talk to Nike about? Wages for the labor. Wages, yep. Yeah. Exactly. So it, this is part of the, the constraints here, right? Yeah. Is by raising the, raising the price of the wages, you're going to theoretically increase the price of the product. Say maybe initially the price of the energy might go higher. So how... That's one challenge they'll have to think about, right? Um, so what, what do you think might help if they, if they have to increase their price, what might help um, in, the, in this side of things, the promotion side of things? That's great. Exactly. So by raising the standard of living, if they're getting paid more, they can buy their own shoes more, right? They could pay more. So that's a, that's a great, great thought. Um, how, about, how about you buying a pair of Nike shoes? Would you buy a pair of Nike shoes that's 50 cents more expensive? No? Yeah. It's a, it's a, wait, and I'm, I'm saying 50 cents. Maybe it's five bucks. If it's five bucks and the Adidas pair of shoes is five bucks less, what would what would make you buy the Nike shoe over the Adidas? Shoe? So the quality is one thing. It would have to either be the same quality or better. So that's the kind of quality. Uh, we'll put qualities kind of in both of these. What what were you saying? Style. Style. Yeah. So that's you'd have to still go back to their core business mandate, right? They have they have to have good products. They can't just say. But how, how about? Maybe has any of you bought something from Product Red before? Have you guys heard of that? Gap and like American Express, Starbucks, they have these packs of coffee or t shirts that say red on them and if you buy them then some of that money goes to the people in Africa that, you know, basically made the shirt or uh people in India that uh, you know helped to create it, right? So that's a promotion. And that makes people, I, I paid more for my Gap sweater because of that. Um, so maybe if people knew that Nike shoes were made in a more sustainable way, either environmentally or socially, they would, they'd pay that extra five bucks, right? 50 cents. Yeah, Tom, Tom's, is it, can you explain the Tom's concept? Um, I know that you buy one and then the same pair goes to like a, a third world country or something like that. Yeah. But the quality you're paying They, they're kind of silly looking shoes. I like them. My, my, my wife has them. Like, I think they're cool, but they look kind of silly, but they're super stylish now and everything. So that's a, that's a brilliant marketing concept, but also business model. They, you buy a pair of shoes, somebody else gets a pair of shoes. Right? Um, so I know we've got about five minutes left, so we can keep talking about this or just kind of get any questions or thoughts more broadly. This is, I mean, it's not that hard, right? You guys could go present to Nike right now and help them figure <laughs> out how they can grow 80% in like two years and all that kind of stuff. So um, does, does this all make sense and interesting? Okay. Let's thank Sean.